Okay, we're very pleased to have with us to, uh, this evening uh, uh, <clears throat> Professor Ted Vagalis from uh, Drury University. Uh, he teaches philosophy there and knows a great deal. And he's going to talk to us uh, this evening about the philosophy of the 18th century. So go right ahead, to Professor Vagalis. Okay. So uh, I, I don't have an indoor voice. It's just an outdoor voice. The curse of me. But if you can't hear, let me know. I'm, I'm glad to speak. And um, when I was preparing my remarks, uh, the Enlightenment is such a large time. And so many things happen that I, it was hard to get focused. And so then I pulled out. I, one of the best teaching gigs I've ever had in my life, second only to Drury, I might add, was when I was a grad student in philosophy at the University of Kansas, I got to teach in their great books course, um, the Western Civilization program. Love that program. And I just, and I realized that um, if you're going to talk about some place to uh, a, an audience uh, about the Enlightenment, you need to have a narrative. And I, so I gleaned stuff from my notes there. And I just remembered the things that I taught there and I've used from time to time. So I thought what I would do tonight is uh, give you a lecture like, uh, like I did in those early days. And uh, please feel free at any moment. I, I think lectures should also be discussions. So as you have questions or comments or criticisms, you should just speak up. I love that. I, I, I would hope this would be interactive. And so forth. All right. Thank you. So yeah, yeah. Please, I, I, th this is the only way to talk about a period like the Enlightenment, and the title is the Enlightenment: its promises and its problems. And what I mean by its promises, I mean the promises it holds out for us, and you're going to see why there are so many promises there. But also, it's bequeathed to us some problems, some challenges that we have to think through, and especially. And, and I think that this period of time. Talking about the Enlightenment is actually timely. It's one of the, it will help us to think about things. Um, so let me kind of set a narrative context for you about the Enlightenment. Modern philosophy begins, for me, I, this, I'm sure lots of people have different ideas. If you want to find the place where modern thought begins, where there is a break with the classical, um, ancient way of talking about things, in philosophy and politics and science, Machiavelli. That's the breaking point. And, let, and here's a, I've got a couple of things I wanted to read here from The Prince. This is the 15th chapter. This is one of the most famous parts of Machiavelli because he's now going to reflect on, on the first half of this book and say, you're probably wondering what gives me the right to prescribe um, anything to anybody about how to be a good prince. He says, it remains now, to this, the chapter is this, of those things for which men, and especially princes, are praised or blamed. Although, as you, you'll see, the title has very little to do with what he talks about. He says, it remains now to see what the modes and government of a prince should be with subjects and with friends. And because I know that many have written of this, I fear that in writing of it again, I mean, I may be held presumptuous, especially since in disputing this matter, I depart from the orders of others. So, people like Aristotle and Plato who have written prior to me. But since my intent is to write something useful to whoever understands it, it has appeared to me more fitting to go directly to the effectual truth of, thing, of the thing than to the imagination of it. And many have imagined republics, hmm, I wonder who he has in mind here, maybe Plato, and many have imagined republics and principalities that have never been seen or known to exist in truth. For it is so far from how one lives to how one should live, or how one ought to live, that he who lets go of what is done for what should be done learns his ruin than his preservation. For a man who wants to make a profession of good in all regards must come to ruin among so many who are not good. Hence it is necessary to a prince, if he wants to maintain himself to be, uh, to learn, or excuse me, if he wants to maintain himself, 
to learn to be able not to be good and to use this and not use it according to necessity. So, unlike Plato, who says the aim or object here is to create a state, a society, that aims at the good. We want people, th we want people to be good. We want them to be how they ought to be um, and not how they are. Machiavelli says that's, that's the big mistake. You need to focus on how people are and deal with them as they are. As he says here, um, learn, to be, uh, learn to be able not to be good and to use this or not use it according to necessity. So this to me is, I, I think, the moment when Machiavelli has announced this break with the past. We don't need to listen to these people anymore. And what's even more interesting is all the examples, the historical examples, tend to be either, con uh, you know, for him, contemporary 15th century, early 16th century Italian examples or Roman examples. Because the Romans were, didn't have Greek city-states, they had large empires. And so Machiavelli thinks that this says more. Now, uh, another reason why I, I think of uh, Machiavelli as the break, this is the very opening pages of The Prince. Um, this is uh, the uh, second chapter of Hereditary Principalities. One of the things I think is interesting about The Prince is Machiavelli always begins by bifurcating stuff and then ignoring, um, once he makes this division, he'll ignore one side of it. So he begins by saying, I'm going to deal with principalities here, because they're run by princes. I've written of republics elsewhere. So there can be republics, and there can be principalities. So we're not going to bother with republics. I've written about that in the discourses. Right? We're going to look at principalities, and just <laughs> principalities. And then he says, okay, so now there are hereditary principalities, and princi principalities where the prince is new, where he's come and acquired his power. Now, here's what Machiavelli says about hereditary principalities. So we've got this bifurcation here. There's hereditary, <coughs> right, where you've inherited from your family or from somebody else. You've inherited your, your uh, principality. And then there's people who go out and sort of conquer someplace, and they become the prince. He says, or, I shall leave out reasoning on republics, because I have reasoned on them at length and, uh, at another time. I shall address myself only to the principality, and shall proceed by weaving together the threads mentioned above. That we, oh, in the, this is the second chapter, not the first. And I shall debate how these principalities may be governed and maintained. I say then that in hereditary states accustomed to the bloodline of their prince, the difficulties in maintaining them are much less than in new states because it is enough only not to depart from the order of his ancestors and then to temporize in the face of accidents. So... To, if, you, if, if you're Queen Elizabeth, just do what your <coughs> ancestors have done. You know, they, they've set all the customs and precedents for you. And then in those situations that are kind of anomalous, you know, different, temporize, right? Okay, well, in this way, if such a prince is of ordinary industry, he will always maintain himself in his state unless there is an extraordinary and excessive force which deprives him of it and should he be deprived of it, if any mishap whatever befalls the occupier, he reacquires it. The, the irony of this passage is that, look, you may think you're a hereditary monarch, but you're really a new monarch. And you always have to be thinking about not just keeping power, but acquiring power. Because if you don't do that, what's going to happen? An, ex an extraordinary and excessive force is going to come along and knock you down. Okay? But that's not what I think is the most interesting thing here. Machiavelli says this. Think of this language for just a second and ask yourself, where have you heard this language? So, in this way, if such a prince is of ordinary industry, he will always maintain himself in his state unless there is an extraordinary and excessive force which deprives him of it. Who does that sound like to you? Where have you heard this kind of language? What do you think? Newton. Newton! But this is way before, it's like a hundred years before Newton. I, I think this, this is wonderful. Because I wonder, and I have no way of knowing what, where Newton got his ideas, although an awful lot of these 17th century thinkers 
spent a lot of time reading Machiavelli. Hobbes, Locke, you know, you name them, they've read him. And they certainly talk like him. And then when you read this passage, I've often wondered, hmm, motion, right? But by the way, this could also be something you could trace back to Thucydides, right? In his history of the Peloponnesian War, he opens up by saying <coughs> the war between the Greek or between the Spartans and the Athenians is the greatest motion that's ever been, right? War is everything in motion. But still he sounds like Newton. And, and the narrative I would like to sketch here is there is, a, there is something beginning here. There's something stirring in this very early modern period that's going to be shaping the language and the thought, and we're going to see it come to fruition, full bloom in the Enlightenment. Okay? So here's Machiavelli kind of breaking with the ancients. We're no longer going to talk about teleology. We're not going to say that there are these rational purposes out there in the nature of things, and that this tells us how we ought to be. No, we're going to look at things causally, right? We're going to look at what causes what. And we're not going to worry about any of that. And that's going to shape how we talk. Now, um, so right after Machiavelli then, is the scientific revolution. Um, here's where you have um, Copernicus, you have Galileo, you have Descartes, you have Kepler, and you have Newton. What's going on? Well, I think we can continue to see them working on the same vein of thinking that Machiavelli has unleashed. I, I think Machiavelli is a very revolutionary thinker. Um, he, on the one hand, he says armed prophets are better than unarmed prophets, but he does note that Jesus, who is not an armed prophet, has had far more effect than many a king. Uh, and this sort of stuff. And I think Machiavelli kind of sees what he's doing like this. He's going to be changing how people think and understand the world. So let's go to Copernicus. Copernicus, um, he has sort of figured out something here. He said, you know, we have this, it seems so natural to us to think that the sun is going across the sky, that it's in motion and we're not. And Machiavelli says, or excuse me, and Copernicus is saying, hmm, what if that's not the case? What if we are in motion and not the sun? It would be awfully hard for us to, to know that. But he's got to try and figure it out. So he doesn't have any uh, evidence for this. There are no telescopes, uh, other sorts of things. But he is trying to uh, move his thinking away from this old Aristotelian and Ptolemaic view to try to sort of figure out the nature of the heavens and so forth. He doesn't want to talk about how it ought to be. He wants to see it as it is. And so he has this, uh, comes up with this uh, um, uh, uh, heliocentric model of the universe instead of the geocentric model of the universe or solar system. And he now has inspired Galileo. But unlike Copernicus, Galileo has something. What's he got? Telescope. He's got a telescope. Yeah. And so he now can, can give us, put some meat on this theory that Copernicus has. And so what does he do? He looks at the sky. And where we would just see random stars and sort of stuff, he notices that, he notices that there are particular ways those stars are set and that they change at different times of the year. And so he keeps careful track. He looks up there. He can he'll draw out the, the background stars he sees. And then he'll compare them in December and in March, in June and September. Right? And guess what? The background patterns change. And all of a sudden he says, this is proof that we're in motion and not the sun. <coughs> right? So now he has seen things how they are and not how we think they ought to be. Right? Um, so, so this is Galileo. But Galileo still has one problem. He has the same problem Kepler had, the same defect. Anybody know what Kepler's, de uh, not Kepler, Copernicus. What's wrong with, the, with Ke Copernicus's conception of the heliocentric model of the solar system? Lots of things. Yeah, circles. Circles, yeah. It's because we think that's how it ought to be. God would not do things in some crazy kind of... It, it's, it's the circles. 
And so Kepler comes along and says, I can solve that problem. Right? I can't tell you why it's this way. I can just tell you that it's happening. And it's Kepler's laws of planetary motion. And now we have the ellipses. Okay? And then Newton comes along and he says, well, I can tell you why they're ellipses, because it's gravity, right? And of course, Newton's very famous law, uh, formulation of one of the laws is um, objects fall in a straight line until some excessive force, right? Come extraordinary and excessive force pushes it in another direction, right? So here we are. We're, we're in motion, except so is the floor. And the reason we're not falling is because the floor's motion is stronger than us, right? So we don't fall anymore. So, uh, and, and these things are easy to figure out and, and so forth. Uh, notice that if uh, Aristotle, Aristotle's um, argument for why smoke goes up, flame goes up, but when you throw a rock in the water, it goes down, and a piece of wood, it floats, is Aristotle says, look, um, all this stuff here, Inside these objects are what we call occult powers. It doesn't have anything to do with witchcraft. Occult just means hidden powers. And uh, we can't see them, whatever. But we all know what happens when I let this go. It'll fall to the table. Or when we see smoke, it'll go up. Our feathers will float, whatever. That's because the occult powers, you know, they're, they're what are, are, are doing this. Anyway, um, and... Uh, Newton says, yeah, but you could never prove that there are occult powers here, right? And if we, if we use his theory, gravity, this is something we can empirically prove. So, so there is this narrative of, of jettisoning, jettisoning this how things ought to be to talk about how things actually are. And we see this coming in the scientific revolution. And it completely has begun to shape how the uh, modern mind thinks and views uh, the world around it. And many of the things that Newton said that we'll be able to predict with this new physics and so forth, <coughs> these are things that people didn't figure out until into the 18th century and beyond into the 20th century. Um, the 17th and 18th century, people were still trying to figure out, well, okay, does this work or not? We, we think it's true. We're pretty sure it's true. But like electricity, we have to wait until when? Franklin, yeah. So Franklin's got <coughs> his key and his kite, and he's trying to sort of figure out um, this. Uh, uh, I, I can't remember if his is the corpuscular theory, um, but yeah. So, so I mean, we have all these experiments being conducted, trying to figure out how to explain all this stuff. But this is why the 18th century, the Age of Enlightenment, is so immensely important because all of a sudden, like the floodgates were open, and all these things that Newton's science had predicted. People had worked up the experiments, and they were all beginning to sort of fall into place. Now, where uh, in antiquity, we had always said that what we called natural science today was simply natural philosophy. Um, it was natural philosophy because philosophical questions were guiding them. These were speculative questions, you know, questions about being and becoming, and, you know, whether or not water or earth or fire or air was the... <coughs> Um, basic element of things and, and so forth. But now, the sciences, the, the, the natural sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, all these things, astronomy, were moving away from philosophy. We now had methods. Descartes gave us methods and, and others that we could then begin to refine and adapt to their particular subject matter. So Descartes comes along and a lot of people think cogito ergo sum, this is Descartes' great <coughs> gift. No, it's the thing that used to torment me when I was in middle school, well, junior high, was what we called it back then. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Everybody does. Cartesian coordinates. Oh. Oh. <laughs> right? But it's, I, and, and I understand how this can help you plot and graph things. I didn't realize until I got into college and started doing philosophy why that was so important. Because now you could take nature and plot and chart and graph the whole thing. You could measure it. And what did this do? Unlike the ancients, this gave us this unbelievable power to bend and shape nature to our will, to serve our needs. This is a, a, an unbelievable power that Descartes had unlocked. You see this in um, 
um, in, in the meditations. So, it, it, so after he's doubted everything in the first meditation, he has to figure out, okay, so what's, what's left? He's thinking, so I'm, I'm this substance. But he makes this incredible distinction between mental substance, the cogito, and physical, bodily, corporeal substance. And he says, you know, this substance is extended, flexible, changeable. And that's when I figured out, oh, that's what Cartesian coordinates were all about. This is the stuff you can measure and, and bend and manipulate and change so it serves our purposes. This is, an, this is an incredible discovery that Descartes bequeathed to us. And I'm thinking to myself, I, 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 I now see how all this works. So now we, and, and, and then we just start refining these empirical methods and how we're going to attack these problems and use what science teaches us to develop our technology. And it's here at the end of the 17th and into the 18th century that all this stuff changes. By the way, think of what happens in 1776. What's the great book that's published in 1776? Common sense? No. Wealth of Nations. The Wealth of Nations. Why is that, why is that important to know? Not just about capitalism, but economic production benefits from its capability of being um, made more efficient. Say that again. I said that in a convoluted way. L let me give the example. The most famous example um, from, uh, from Adam Smith is the pin factory, right? So what does it take to make a pin? Well, you've got to cut pieces of wire. Then you've got to sharpen, sharpen one end of it for a point. Then you've got to put a little head on the pin right? And so imagine if you're the only person doing this, how many pins are you going to make in a day? But um, if we have the tools that we're, and, and we can sort of separate out this, divide the labor up, right? Division of labor and, and get specialized people. So we have one person who will be cutting the wire, another person who will be doing all this stuff. In, in other words, it's possible to measure the productive process and to think about ways in which we might refine it and make it serve our human purposes. And not only that, we now have the technology to take materials and fashion things out of them, right? Um, and, and, and just make things better and mass produce them so that a person who's making 10 pins a day can now make, or a pound of, or 10 pins a day can now make a pound a week or 10 pounds a week or 10 pounds a day just by having this remarkable division of labor specializing in certain tasks and so forth. So all of these things sort of kind of flow one from the other and it dramatically transforms our life. And not only that, um, think about you know steam engines and other sorts of things that come on that. In, in fact, I have to share with you, um, uh, this is a, a, a selection from Condorcet, The Progress of the Human Mind. Um, Condorcet, he begins with this, uh, this by the way, this was written, uh, I think it's in 1794. It's in the last year of his life. Condorcet had, was a big supporter of the French Revolution, Robespierre and people like this, except that at a certain point he had some questions about what they were doing, and Robespierre was not somebody you questioned, and so he went into hiding for several months, and he produced this huge book. And then he got arrested and got his head cut off. So, but Condorcet, he, he begins this last... Uh, stage of human history by, by saying this. This is, this is the tenth epoch. If man can predict almost with certainty those appearances of which he understands the laws, if even when the laws are unknown to him, experience of the past enables him to foresee with considerable probability future appearances, why should we suppose it a chimerical undertaking to delineate with some degree of truth the picture of the future destiny of mankind from the results of its history. He wants to take this last part and tell you he's going to predict what's going to happen. He says, the only foundation of faith in the natural sciences is the principle that the general laws, known or unknown, which regulate the phenomena of the, of the universe, are regular and constant. And why should this principle, applicable to the other operations of nature, be less true when applied to the development of the intellectual and moral faculties of man? In short, as opinions formed from experience relative to the same class of objects 
are the only rule by which men of soundest understanding are governed in their conduct, why should the philosopher be proscribed from supporting his conjectures upon a similar basis, provided he attribute to them no greater certainty than the number, con consistency, and accuracy of actual observations uh, that the actual observations authorize? And, and then he begins to say, okay, so what are we going to be able to do with this? Well, the first thing is he talks about education. People who couldn't keep their own checkbook are going to learn how to, you know, accounting. They're going to learn basic accounting. They're going to learn um, how to maintain their own basic health and so forth. In other words, we're going to be able to educate everybody. Why? Because unlike Plato and Aristotle, this is not an education for the elite. These are not these abstract ideas that seem to elude us. These are fundamental, basic truths about the nature of things that put us in charge of our own lives. So people are going to be able to, 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 to live good, healthy lives. They're going to be able to sort of uh, take care of their checkbooks. They're going to understand human affairs such that they will be able to vote and to hold office, right? These are some of the most fundamental things that we believe in, right? This is generated right here in the 18th century. And, and so he says... Uh, um, from the equality of instruction we can hope to attain, and with which you ought to be satisfied, is that which excludes every species of dependence, whether forced or voluntary. We may exhibit in the actual state of human knowledge the easy means by which this end may be attained, even for those who can devote to study but a few years of infancy, and in subsequent life only some occasional hours of leisure. He says we might shew that by a happy choice of the subjects to be taught, and of the mode of inculcating them, the entire mass of a people may be instructed in everything necessary for the purposes of domestic economy, for the transaction of their affairs, for the free development of their industry and their faculties, for the knowledge, exercises, and protection of their rights, for a sense of their duties and the power of discharging them, for the capacity of judging both their own actions and the actions of others by their own understanding, for the acquisition of all the delicate or dignified sentiments that are an honor to humanity. So the first thing, this scientific education isn't just an education about how to do things. It gives you the power and capacity to be in charge of your life. Um, I remember my dad, and uh, I, he only had a high school education. He quit, uh, I don't think he quit, I mean, he stopped going to school when he graduated from high school and went straight to work for the railroad, like his father had done. Great penmanship, by the way. I have this, I've always had the worst penmanship. And my dad used to write with all these flowery and so forth. But that was his generation. I used to be amazed at this. And he loved to hold a pen and to write and so forth. I'm just, I used to look at that and just say, and by the way, I don't, his hands were puffy and thick fingers, you know. And I never understood how he could be so delicate. He could take the finest things and, and work with them. And me, my fingers are all clumsy. I don't, that's why I, I read books. You don't have to do stuff with your fingers. <laughs> but, um, but he actually knew stuff, right? I, I, I was always amazed at how he would refer, like I would read some book. He said, oh yeah, I read that when I was in high school. And I'm like, really? And, but he, he never really talked about it until I was you know, old enough to figure things out. And I was always surprised at stuff that he knew. And, and also that he kept reading. He, he read the newspaper all the time. And, uh, this sort of stuff. This is this is what Condorcet has in mind. Once this scientific education takes hold, um, even when you get beyond the formal schooling process, you know your K through 12 years, you should be capable of running your own life. You already have enough to make sense out of things, and this is the great promise. Uh, uh, look at this. He says, uh, 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 "Where where is it?" Uh, he says this. If we pass to the progress of the arts, those arts, particularly the theory of which depends on these very same sciences, physics, astronomy, this sort of stuff, we shall find that it can have no inferior limits. The same processes are susceptible of the same improvement, the same simplifications as the scientific methods, that instruments, machines, looms will add every day to the capabilities and skill of man, will augment at once the excellence and precision of his works, while they will diminish the time and labor necessary for executing them. By the way, notice that we are worried about being replaced by machines today. Aren't we? We are worried that these computers are going to come along and we're not going to have any room for anything. But this is not the hope of Condorcet. He's saying, look, we're going to be making a whole ton of stuff. 
And we're going to have more time to do things. We don't, and it's not going to kill us. I mean, if you think about how long human history has been breaking their bodies, being consumed with all this labor, and um, you, I'm, I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, wow. Look, I, um, uh, think about today. Um, people live much longer than, they, than even when I was growing up. I think, I, I remember the, the, just in terms of men, I, I think it was 65 or 66 was the average lifespan. I, I think it's well over that now. Women have always lived longer. Um, we have people living a long time today. And it's not just because we, we have better drugs and, and these sorts of things, or maybe better medical knowledge, but just people take a little better care of themselves. We eat better than we ever did. And we're not being killed by all the work we do earlier in our life, which, you know, you see, I, I, used, I used to marvel at pictures of people in the 19th century. I'd see somebody who looked, who was like 18, 19 years old, I'd think, eh, are you sure? Because that looks like 40 to me, right? And, and, but you're realizing that diets are better, and the labor we have to put into things is so much less because we have these machines. So but here's the, what's that? go ahead. So the only thing I think of is when I was growing up, they talked about how dishwashers and washing machines, et cetera, was going to make our lives wonderful because it gives us more time, and now we're worried about machines taking over. It's like, okay, so before we had to do all the labor, yeah. and then are we, are we so relieved because we don't have to do all of it, and now it's like, oh, shit, we don't have anything to do. Right, yeah. I, I will say this, though. <coughs> that, uh, my first job was as a dishwasher, so I, I learned to do that. And my dissertation was built on washing a lot of dishes. And what I mean by that is this. When you're writing something, and sometimes I used to be frustrated, and I don't know why dishwashing was the magic thing. I would go up and do the dishes. And my wife and my kids would say, we have a dishwasher. And I go, yeah, tonight it's me. <laughs> that, but that's a joke from when I was growing up, and I'd say to my parents, why don't we get a dishwasher? And my dad says, we have one. We actually have four of them, <laughs> right? So the, when he said one, I was like, I was looking around, and then he said we have four, and then I looked at me, and I said, okay, yeah, I get it, okay. But for some reason, doing that helped. So, but I would still much rather have a dishwasher and a lawnmower and, and all those other things. And, and so it stands to reason that the fear we have of machines displacing us, um, I, I think we'll figure out some other way to employ people, but... The great thing is, look, we're not being crushed because we're lifting heavy things and it's falling on us, and we have machines that do that now. But, but, but notice what, here, here's the thing that got me when I was like, wow, this guy really knows what he's talking about. A smaller portion of ground will then be made to produce a portion of provisions of higher value or greater utility. A greater quantity of enjoyment will be produced at a smaller expense of consumption, the same manufactured or artificial commodity will be produced at a smaller expense of raw materials or will be stronger and more durable. Every soil will be great, uh, appropriated to productions which will satisfy a greater number of wants with the least labor and taken in the small, smallest quantities. Thus, the means of health and frugality will be increased together with the instruments and the arts of production of curing commodities and manufacturing their pro produce without demanding the sacrifice of one enjoyment by one consumer. That, that phrase, that one portion of ground, a smaller portion of ground, will produce more than what, what they're currently producing. I, I'm pretty sure this, th this is true, although, don't quote me on this. You can erase this part of the tape. No, no. Mm -hmm. um, I think we farm less farmland today than we did 100 years ago. And, and not only that, we... Think of how much more we produce. That's because we can grow so much more on, a, on an acre of ground than we could. And seeds have been developed which are a little more resistant to uh, disease and bugs and, and, and these sorts of things. So Condorcet is just kind of reading off what will eventually follow from all of this. Uh, by the way, by the way this, this is one of the pieces that helped me to say, look, we have to think of this in, in large narrative swaths if we want to understand a period like this. He, he talks about governments. He, um, Hamilton, Federalist uh, 9, I think it is, in, in the first um, few Federalists, especially 6 through 9, I think J Hamilton writes the first one, Jay writes the next couple, and then Hamilton has 6 through 9. Hamilton trashes democracy. 
the worst form of government ever invented. It's the most violent. It's the most long. Uh, it's the most short-lived. Um, it's the most corrupt. All this sort of stuff. He says, you look at the history books. <coughs> democracies are, they're a disaster. And then, and then he, and then he goes starts going through six, seven, and eight. And he start starts talking about how terrible it is. He says a man must be foregone in speculation to think that if we were to not have an actual government, if we just had the thirteen states that these states wouldn't be attacking each other at the drop of a hat, which they already were under the Articles of Confederation. So, but, but then he, he says something remarkable. So, uh, guess what kind of government we framed? A democracy. So why are, why are we doing this? Because the science of politics today is much better than before. And it comes from Machiavelli. That's the initial point there. But um, he... he he then starts, so, so this is what Condorcet says. He says, uh, people being more enlightened and having resumed the right of disposing for themselves of their blood and their treasure will learn by degrees to regard war as the most dreadful of all calamities. Right? And David Hume used to play this game with his friends. When they were driving along, going somewhere, he would say, okay, um, if you were a nation, if you were a leader of a nation, what would you do to become the most powerful nation in the world? And his friends would say, well, I developed this weapon, and I developed this weapon. I, I'd have, I'd have lasers, and you know, then I, well, I'd have, uh, you know, buzz, you know. And, and he said, and they asked him, well, what would he do? He said, I would build the best economy, and I would be the one out there supplying people with all the things they needed. And eventually, I'd be the strongest nation in the world, and I'd be running everything. And so, so this is this is what uh, Condorcet is trying to talk about here. He says, nations will know that they cannot become conquerors without losing their freedom, that perpetual confederations are the only means of maintaining their independence, that their object should be security and not power. By degrees, commercial prejudices will die away. A false mercantile interest will lose the terrible power of imbuing the earth with blood and of ruining nations under the idea of enriching them. And, and then he says, uh, institutions in democratic societies will become better They'll become more informed. They will, they will not operate solely by self-interest, but they will be driven to understand what is the best thing for a particular nation. I don't know how that works out today, but it'll be interesting to see if, how, how it turns out. Anyway, um, so Condorcet has this really expansive vision, and, and he lays out in great detail all the wonderful things. By the way, the most, he thinks the most important moment of progress will come when our scientific knowledge extends equality to what's the most most pressing inequality of all? Wow. We've got so many women. There are so many. I think of women, but right that's now. That's the one. Where is that? Right. Where, that's where the, that's, that's the, one the one that's going on the longest. The, and that's right the, now the, we got GBLQ win, etc. Right, but here's what he's here's what he says. Um, uh, oh, he he regards this as the most barbaric of all the inequalities that we have. And um, thank you. And and yeah, and without it, we can never uh, have the kind of moral society that we need. Ah, here it is. Among those causes of human improvement that are of most importance to the general welfare must be included the total annihilation of the prejudices which have established between the sexes and inequality of rights, fatal even to the party which it favors. In vain might we search for motives by which to justify this principle in difference of physical organization, of intellect, or of moral sensibility. That was the old Platonic Aristotelian justification. It had at first no other origin but abusive strength, and all the attempts which have since been made to support it are idle sophisms. So um, this, for um, Condorcet, will be the greatest of all the things that our scientific education and understanding will, will do for him. We will finally arrive at that place where we have this equality of all, and it won't take place until women are recognized as the equals of men and treated. This, this um, was written in 1794? Yes. 
And so hoot, hoot. we've done a lot of changing since 1794. Not enough. <laughs> no, not well, enough. It, it, it just should, but I, I think what I, I think what Connor saying others would say. Look, what's that again? He says we've done a lot of changing. I say we have not reached an omega point. Right. Yeah. Look, obviously for women, a hundred years ago things got a lot better when they got the vote, um, and we have try to sort of keep that momentum going, but it has not, uh, um, I, I would defer to the women in the room, but equal pay hasn't happened yet. Um, face it, the, what's the most, the, the, we used to say the woman's place is in the home. Well, if that's the case, we should have paid them for it, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is some of the best work, but it goes uncompensated, and uh, I've always been puzzled why we don't actually understand the hypocrisy of saying, look, you should be in the home, you should have families. Well, you should pay people for that. Um, and uh, by the way, as I recall, that is a pretty important task. <laughs> Probably we ought to be thinking about that. But Unless we take it for granted. Unless we take it for granted. But, but the other thing, too, is we've deprived ourselves. Uh, like if, I remember Milton Friedman. Uh, I remember seeing an interview with him, and he was asked, um, Milton Friedman wanted to know, or somebody asked him about um, uh, racism in the workplace. And uh, he says that uh, people who discriminate in the workplace are doing the, uh, it, it's the stupidest economic thing ever. Why? Because you're, te you're, you're, you're um, decreasing the pool of competent mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Right? Well, we, up to that point, we've been decreasing it by 50%, or a little over 50%. Um, and, you know, this doesn't make uh, economic sense. The only problem here is that markets are insensitive to those things, and we have to do our part through law and by rethinking our culture um, uh, to accommodate uh, the rightful place. And, but this is, this is all happening in this period of enlightenment. It is. It understands the dignity of human beings, and it also understands how all human beings should be part, should share in this process of creating societies, and of building the right kinds of communities and so forth, and increasing our knowledge about things. There is no question that as we look um, at the science, I teach philosophy of science. It's one of the courses I have to do. Uh, I love it, and there are some really good essays in in philosophy of science about the impact of women in terms of science. So we have this theory, uh, I wonder where we might have gotten it from, where we think that males are dominant in nature and that females are subordinate and, and this sort of stuff. Well, it so happens that when women get into uh, science and they start observing animals, for example, they notice that, hmm, that doesn't seem right. They notice that females have an awful lot of uh, power <coughs> and choice in terms of mates, in terms of who they will obey and this sort of stuff. And one woman sort of pointed out, well, maybe we ought to rethink this view that somehow males are dominant in nature. Maybe we ought to look at the way in which these animals behave a little more closely, and we will find out that we've been sort of imposing on nature some of our own values. Mm -hmm. And, and, and by the way, this has been some, so now you see some of these behavioral studies about animals and so forth, and they're beginning to rethink this and um, this sort of stuff. But look, when you exclude people in science or in business, you exclude some of the people that may, in fact, be the people you need to help you do things. So that goes back to where you started with this, this idea of we need to look at how things are instead of how we think they should be. So, so men set up the world how they think it should be, and that's with women subordinate, and it's like, nah, that doesn't work. Right. Well, <laughs> I think it's been, it's been supported by direct observation, like how going and exploring how things actually are. Let's, let's, let's start from, let's not start with the assumption that this, is, this must be how things are because they've always been this way, we've always been right. it to be this way. Let's examine, let's start from zero and say, well, let's observe how things actually are. Let's not go any with assumption. Right. Yeah. And this is, this is a very kind of liberating period here. This is really transforming 
um, how people think about things. Here's something to think about. Um, does anybody know why Alexis de Tocqueville and Gustave uh, de Beaumont came, uh, why they came to America? Well, we, we know why they came to America, because they wanted to, to see democracy firsthand. But you, you had to have a better reason than that, because that sounds a lot like, oh, I'm taking a gap year, right? <laughs> Nobody's going to pay for a gap year. I found that out. Um, so what was their reason for coming over here? Because America at the time, this is 1831, 1832, we were famous for our prison system. We had model penitentiaries that people thought, they're pretty good at this. And they're pretty good at rehabilitating people and getting them back into society and so forth. Why? Because we had all this knowledge that philosophers and uh, 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 burgeoning social sciences were, were giving us. And people were trying to sort of say, hey, wait a minute, rather than just brutalizing people in prison, hoping that they will not be upset by that and get back to changing their ways, that, that maybe if we treat them like human beings and give them skills and help them out, maybe we won't have recidivism. Uh, maybe um, we might be able to make uh, prisons um, a better place. We're not talking about making it a hotel with all the amenities. We're just simply saying that, look, this should be place a place where somebody can um, come to have a second chance. So that's why they came. They said, you know, there are all these prisons over there. We'd like to get over there. And they actually did that. They, they came back and they wrote a report and then Tocqueville wrote Democracy in America. And he talked about what was happening there. <clears throat> but, um, um, but we were enlightened about that. This is, this is what was happening. And people were beginning to think in terms of what they could do given the kind of science and other sorts of things that they had. Let, let me know when, when I've gone on a little too long. I'll, 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 um, I don't, I don't. Let, let me just say, uh, the, the last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of promises, um, democracy and the world. And what was really interesting is when you read people like, for example, Immanuel Kant and, and, and others, is they have this idea that democracy will be universal. Um, I remember, and this idea sort of hit me in, in my head when um, about 30 years ago, um, right as the Berlin Wall was coming down and Gorbachev had talked about uh, um, um, perestroika and glasnost and all this other sort of stuff, openness, um, uh, this fellow, a young PhD from Harvard who was working in George H.W. Bush's uh, State Department, his name was Francis Fukuyama. And he'd been working on a book because he'd been paying attention to what was happening. And uh, the book was called The End of History. And that was the title of this article. And I remember this. When, it first, when this article first came out, which was a praise of his book, he got just lambasted for this. This can't possibly be true. But Fukuyama said, in 1806, Hegel has just sent his manuscript for his famous book, The Phenomenology of History. In, in the post. He's at Jena. And who's knocking on the gates of Jena with his cannons? Napoleon. And uh, as, as his thing is looking away, he's looking at the city gates and he goes, at that moment I saw the world historical spirit riding through the gates of Jena on horseback. It was Napoleon himself. So why is Napoleon, this evil, brutal dictator, um, why is he the world historical spirit? Because he took the ideals of the French Revolution and he scattered them across Europe as he went conquering all these places. And so French norms and French laws, you know, fraternity, equality, liberty, became uh, the, the hope and aspiration of people. It was the moment, Fukuyama says, he, uh, that Hegel, where Hegel claims that, we had, that democracy had reached that absolute moment, when it became impossible to think of anything else other than a democratic society. This is where the ideals of the Enlightenment, again, just sort of congealed. And all those hopes of humanity were, were set. And now, of course, in the 20th century, democracy had to contend with communism and with fascism and all sorts of authoritarianism. But at the end of the Cold War, democracy was the last person standing. It was the last game in town. And Fukuyama said... Um, this is what he meant by the end of history. Not that history ends, but 
we had kind of reached that moment where we see what this was all about. Immanuel Kant wrote about this in, in a couple of important essays. Um, one is the um, idea of a universal history with a cosmopolitan intent, and the other one is called perpetual peace. But in these essays, Kant talked about this development of the human species. And um, he says that, you know what? Uh, nature, we want to live easy. And a lot of people, like, they, they, they think that we would be great if we just sit around in this Arcadian existence, tending our sheep, and just kind of living, you know, living loose and large. But he says that's not what nature intended. Nature pushed us. It gave us problems. It made us suffer. And it forced us to solve problems. And one of those great problems was how we were going to get people to cooperate. And that would come about only if everybody had a say in it. Everybody had a part in it. And so democracy gr will, will grow from this. And then eventually, when we think of rights, we'll think of rights have to be coupled with the power of the state. This power of the state will be used to make sure that people's rights are protected. This will have democracy. And then we will see democracy spread across the world. Nations will become democratic. And they will have to learn to partner together, not as one world government, but as parts of what he called the League of Nations. And, um, and, and so we see this dream that has, I think, a lot of, uh, of, of it's, we're cashing in on it today. So um, uh, am I done? I think you're done. OK, I, I, I got a few more. I, there are some problems. I didn't talk about Rousseau. He Let had a lot of trouble with this, so I, I just finish. leave that. I'm sorry I took so long, sir. No, I need to finish. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Professor. Yeah. I think that we enjoyed that. Uh, I, now, uh, now uh, we have three choices. Number one, you can ask uh, uh, Professor Magalis questions. Number two, you can eat dessert. Uh, number three, you can go on a tour with me of the building. Uh, so uh, you could do two and three, and I'll stand here and answer any questions you have. <laughs> I, 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 I love you. Got my juices flowing. I, I'm I'm revved up, ready to go. So anybody who wants to, I'll, I'll sit and talk with you. Very good, very good. Uh, I did want to say one thing. Uh, last night on television, uh, on PBS, there was a very uh, fine program. If anybody had a chance to see it, what's the name of it? Uh, I don't remember the name, uh, but it lasted uh, it lasted for two hours and went a little long. But uh, uh, what was it about? What was it about? Uh, it was about. Uh, uh, it started out with uh, a professor Picker from Harvard who says things are getting better. Yes. And uh, it. Uh, Stephen Pinker. Yeah. Uh, Enlightenment now. Enlightenment now, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and pardon? It was about less violence. Less yeah. violence, yes. The world is less violent now than it's ever been in the history of this world. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay, now, uh, do you think it's continuing to become less violent? Yes, so far. That doesn't mean it can't get more violent, but if, if you look at. Um, at, at uh, wars and revolutions and other sorts of things, no matter what the news says, there are places where it's really bad. But overall, the level of violence and death has gone down. It's it's this is the safest time to be alive. Poverty is dramatically reducing worldwide. As right, well. mm -hmm. it is, and um, well, it's going up in our country. But right, but but actually, uh, yeah, yes, sir. I didn't, and I went on too long. I apologize. Can I, no, I, I no. didn't get to Rousseau. Do some. Okay, Do some. Rousseau. Um, so here's Rousseau. All of his French um, friends, Voltaire, Diderot, they love this. They love what's happening. Voltaire shaking his head. This is bad. This is really bad. And there was this famous essay contest out of the Dijon Academy in Switzerland. And the question was, have the sciences and the arts contributed to the moral improvement of humanity. Descartes said, or Descartes, Rousseau said, no, absolutely not. He says the sciences will make us more competitive with each other. They will alienate us for each other. They will increase inequality. They will completely disrupt 
all that sympathy and fellow feeling we have for each other. The origin of the sciences are in our vanities, our greed, our self-interest. Astronomy, it comes from astrology, right? The reason we love science and technology is it makes me more powerful. It makes me better able to get more, even if it means at the expense of somebody else. Descartes thinks that one of the problems about the rise and development of the arts and sciences is that it flatters us, speaks to our vanities, makes us, makes us argue with each other, and it, makes us it, it gives some people greater control over society than others. He wants to argue for going, he, unlike Kant, uh, he wants to go back to a little more pastoral kind of setting. We need to get back to a time when we had those manly virtues and, the, and these sorts of things. But by the way, Rousseau is not a woman's man. Wow. He thinks that women have a particular place and they should know that place and this sort of stuff. But um, so, so Rousseau says, he, he's got some, and, and by the way, he shows, he goes back to antiquity and he says, you know, if you look when, when did Socrates come around? When Athens was in decline. If you look at the Romans and you look at the um, rise of the arts and sciences and so forth in their day, when were these things popular? When the Republic was in trouble, right? What did oratory and rhetoric do? It sent people around saying, oh, right, let me tell you these great things, these things that you'll like. Vote for me. Follow me. And, of course, everybody wants to line up and go with these people, right? Um, it, 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 what's the title of one of my, um, one, an essay, I, not mine, but an essay I wrote one, for one of my undergraduate classes. We, oh, um, Victoria, uh, Victoria Rosa Loquacitas, The Rise of Rhetoric and the Decline of Everything Else. Um, and, and so th this was just trying to show that rhetoric just simply makes us worse. And I, I think, uh, not just particularly right now with Donald Trump, but if you think of our political history, probably post-Kennedy uh, assassination, it's just been this rhetoric. Just this A distraction. Thing. Talking about yes. it. Yeah. So don't pay any attention to these problems over here. This is what you should be paying attention to over mm -hmm. here. So um, did you... Uh, Magnified recently, but yes. Yeah. I'm thinking the age of enlightenment was also on the social side the age of enclosures. Yes. Which were not... That was not an enlightened kind of movement. Right. And I, I think part of the problem was having um, one of the things that we were really good at, we, that the scientists really helped us get good at, is war. Uh, contrary to what uh, Condorcet was hoping, and sort of empowered some nations at the expense of other nations. Could be argued it's the other way around. War made us really good at science. War drove the... The right. Uh, well, there's no question about that. Um, the, we, we had to come up with better ways to kill more people and, and so forth like this. But, but the application of science to warfare comes a little later. Right? Science is already there, and then we turn it to, the, to, to that. Um, and, and I think that Rousseau and others were just simply saying that this is going to um, send people around the world imposing their interests. R remember, um, Far was it Farragut who went into... Uh, no, no, Commodore Perry, who goes into Tokyo and says, look, we want to open trade with you. Take a look at our battleships. This should tell you what free trade is all about, right? I mean, it's, it's, th this is that downside um, that I think some people are worried about with that. Um, you know, I mean, you would, you would hope that it would make us more civil, and in some ways it has, and, and, and by the way, regardless of what you think of impeachment or not, I, I, I do think we're getting kind of a dose of the importance of institutions and norms and things like this. You know, a regularized policy of doing things is very important. You break that order at your peril. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know that this is what judgment you should make about this. That's not my point. It's just that, look, when the professionals are telling you something, you're, we don't trust them that much anymore, but we should. Uh, that's, by the way, another problem for the Enlightenment. Okay. We some. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom. Uh, and the tour leaves in three minutes. <laughs> I'll be really quick. So, so, so I, I think, by the way, because uh, but this is something Tocqueville spoke about in Democracy in America. Remember that the first volume is Democracy, American Democracy, its institutions. Yay! Now, the second volume is, well, there's a little darker side to democracy, which is 
First of all, individual, individualism, individuality. It empowers everybody. Nobody trusts anybody. They think they can figure things out for themselves, but then it puts us all on our own little island, and then we feel insecure. We start listening to the loudest crowd. We start joining with them. And Tocqueville says, well, nobody trusts anybody anymore. And so professionalization goes by the wayside. And we start letting our interest creep in and decide things. And sometimes that leads to real problems. So, so, so we, do, we do pay some price. Look, I'm not opposed to shaking up the institutions of government from time to time. But there are some things that you can't do without. And norms are very important in, in that respect. So, um, that, and that's, that's not a partisan notion. That's just common sense. Theory of organizations and stuff like that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I love coming up here to talk to people. You didn't talk about religion at all. I have tons of stuff on that. And, and I, 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 that's because I'm long-winded. You know, one of the things about... Copernicus and Galileo and those guys, it weakened the authority of the church. Absolutely. Absolutely. Luther, Luther comes along and says, look, I, I'm, I'm just as good as some um, theologian at figuring out what the Bible says. I don't need those people. This, this becomes problematic. It's great on the one hand because it puts people in play. Luther, what Luther Come did, back again and do a whole other talk, please. I'd be happy to. That would be wonderful. We didn't even talk about the family. In, in, <laughs> in, 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 we got lots more to talk about. One of the colonial people serious. sent me I, I would love to do that. <laughs> Can you that the Enlightenment had its own say some magic and words and make it into real pictures? Uh, yeah. Yeah. They, they, so, they, maybe they okay. set themselves against the one they inherited. But they weren't going to get along with that one. Right. And it, it was the fact that they would not recognize that they had this teleology um, that made it difficult for them to square. This is they couldn't going. really live up right. to their... But this is where Hegel comes on the scene. Because Hegel says, yeah, there's a teleology here. It's called democracy. Um, Tocqueville had smoked it out. Other people had smoked it out. Hegel, he, he was the guy that set the pattern. But certainly, the, the, yeah. the, but certainly science lost its teleology. Right. Tele 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 How do you pronounce it? Teleology. Te te oh, teleology. Okay. Science lost that. Right. Uh, my photographer that, wants to get a picture oh, of me yeah. again. Oh, great. That's, that's, that, that's what, what broke the hold <laughs> of the Aristotelian science, the medieval science. Well, where 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 yeah, where, where things that's fell be, 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 because they were trying to get home <laughs> and things you know fire went up because thank you. of the thank you. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh there's yeah. something as far as thank laws you. of motion this is all explained like coming to see my friends friends are, basically I really like I need to come up here a little more even when I'm not talking you deserve the support here thank you very much